Greetings. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, cultural anthropology. I'm going to give you a short introduction to cultural anthropology or sociocultural anthropology as we say sometimes. Uh, in our previous lessons we've talked a little bit about the emergence of anthropology as a discipline in the four fields that uh, are encompassed within anthropology. However, for the rest of the semester we're going to be talking um, about cultural anthropology pretty much exclusively. Uh, and this, of course, is an introduction to cultural anthropology course, so that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, one thing that I want to note here, I'm sure that you've heard me say several times already, I'll say cultural or sociocultural anthropology, and there's a reason that I'm doing that. When Franz Boas uh, defined the four fields at the beginning of the 20th century, he described one of these fields as being cultural anthropology. Uh, for much of the 20th century, um, this form of anthropology was called cultural anthropology in North America, the United States in particular, um, but it was called social anthropology in other places, especially Europe. While there are some, uh, there are some describable differences between how North American cultural anthropology and European social anthropology were practiced, and we will go into some of that later, uh, that distinction is almost irrelevant today. Uh, so if you're studying in a cultural anthropology department, you are probably in the United States. If you're in a social anthropology department, you're probably not in the United States. Uh, but you'll be largely studying the same things. To clarify this, uh, some people call the discipline sociocultural anthropology, making sure that we're including all of the work uh, that's been done under the name of social anthropology and cultural anthropology. Generally speaking, and for our purposes, we can consider them to be the same thing. Um, but I'm in a North American department, and we usually just say North, or we usually would just say cultural anthropology. Uh, so moving on. Uh, as I stated last time, cultural anthropologists study human culture. And I defined this as being the study of learned human behavior. Cultural anthropologists do not believe that observable human cultural difference can be attributed to innate biology. Generally speaking, our belief is that all human beings around the world are equally human, equally intelligent, equally artistic, etc. We do not believe that certain populations of people are more violent or more sexual, more philosophical, or more physical than others. We believe that cultural patterns are learned. Uh, this is what we're referring to when we say culture. And the majority uh, of the human social world uh, and culture, we tend to believe uh, are socially constructed. This position of seeing so much um, of human social behavior as socially constructed is something that both defines cultural anthropology and it also puts us at odds uh, with a lot of popular opinions in society. Uh, let me say, first of all, that cultural anthropology aspires to be a non-ethnocentric discipline. By ethnocentric, I mean um, ethnocentrism is the tendency to judge people and cultures that are not part of one's own culture by the norms and standards of one's own culture. Um, anthropology tries not to be ethnocentric. Uh, something that we have to be very clear about is that ethnocentrism is a very difficult thing for people to overcome. It's difficult for us to overcome. Uh, one of the places where cultural anthropologists sometimes find themselves at odds with our society is when we say that something that our society takes for granted is not universal. Um, one of the most prominent examples of this is the subject of gender. There are a lot of gender norms in our society that people take for granted and people tend to believe that these gender norms are universal. Uh, we think that they're something that is innate to the human species. It's in the DNA of the universe. It's in our DNA or something like that. Um, we have a lot of ideas, uh, for example, of what constitutes appropriate normative male behavior. Uh, 
uh, appropriate normative female behavior. But cultural anthropologists will argue that gender is expressed in a lot of different ways outside of our society, suggesting that the way that we imagine gender in the United States is not something that's actually universal to the human species. And this can be very upsetting to a lot of people because these, these very socially constructed norms can feel like the very foundation of order in our society. Nevertheless, as a cultural anthropologist, uh, I feel comfortable arguing that gender norms that are taken as normative in my society are not universal. And I recognize that gender is something that's expressed in a lot of different ways around the world. Um, that's kind of the way that we approach a lot of things in cultural anthropology. From the very beginning, when cultural anthropology was primarily concerned with non-Western societies or indigenous peoples, uh, we did this. We studied the religion, the economic exchange, the systems of kinship uh, of all these various people, and we saw how different that they all were. We saw how different they all were as we were also seeing how equally human we all are. Thus, we account for this difference as differences in what different people have learned. Um, different learned cultural behavior, not innate biological difference. Um, then we turned that rationale on our own society and we began to see how much of the behavior in our society is just as socially constructed as that of other societies. Uh, this might make a little bit more sense uh, if we describe the practice of cultural anthropology in comparison or contrast with other disciplines, uh, especially some of the other social sciences. If we imagine uh, let's imagine a debate. Um, let's imagine a debate between a cultural anthropologist and an economist, someone who practices economics, and we might see some of this. Uh, I'm not trying to discredit economics, um, which is a totally valid field of study, but there are some disciplinary differences and some differences in what we tend to uh, believe about the world in some ways. An argument that a hypothetical anthropologist uh, might make towards a hypothetical economist might criticize the economist for taking the Western economic system, European and American capitalism, uh, with all of its logics for granted, and then projecting the values um, of that system as being inherent and universal to humanity. A socially constructed norm in capitalist Western society is that human beings are rational agents who make choices based on individual cost-benefit analysis. Uh, taking the institution of money for granted, we often assume, and when I say we, I mean um, in our society, we assume that these transactions have monetary value. Um, people uh, according to capitalism, people make decisions based on trying to gain the maximum individual profit or advantage through that situation. An anthropologist would argue that this is not a universal value. It's not something that exists around the world. This is not the way that people behave everywhere. Um, and the desire to maximize individual personal profit and attain private property is not something that's inherent to humanity. This particular argument uh, takes us back to the early days of the colonial era as capitalism was emerging in Europe. Uh, Portuguese merchants traveled to West Africa and they met West African people there and they attempted to engage in trade with the West African people that they encountered. However, the West African societies that they encountered uh, did not practice the same economic system as Europeans. They did not use money. Uh, they did not imagine objects as having monetary value. And they did not think of trade transactions as bounded 
this was maddening to European merchants who badly, badly wanted to purchase goods from these West African people, pay them money for them, and have that transaction of exchange be considered final. Um, like something like, let's agree that I'm going to pay you a hundred dollars for that bag of jewelry. Uh, you give me the bag of jewelry, I give you a hundred dollars, we shake hands and we part ways and we have no binding obligations uh, to each other after this transaction. Um, in that West African society, like many societies around the world, exchange is not seen as transactional. It did not feature the notion of profit and often involved a very complex system of social obligations between people who were making an exchange. Uh, there was something similar to this that we see uh, in other societies, the concept of hao uh, among Maori people in New Zealand. Um, hao being a word uh, that describes sort of the spirit of a uh, gift, the, the power of, um, you know, when an object goes between two people. Um, we also see something different with the potlatch ceremony of the North American Pacific Northwest. Uh, in the indigenous people there where they had these ceremonies uh, where people would go to these ceremonies and they would attempt to be the person who gave the most stuff. People would go to the ceremony and they would bring all their goods and it was like a competition to see who could give away the most things there. In general, Europeans, um, as they encountered things like this around the world, um, they absolutely hated it. They hated it when they encountered people around the world who practiced economic systems that were different from theirs and then did not share the same values as um, the capitalism and the things that would uh, develop into capitalism in the earlier uh, days of that period. So when Europeans colonized a place, they would pass laws that outlawed these practices. That was very common around the world. Uh, the ethnocentric view was that the European economic system, uh, which ultimately developed into capitalism, was something inherent to humanity. The ethnocentric response, uh, when they encountered people who did not practice this system, um, as they were taking for granted this was a universal and normative system, was that there was something wrong with the people. There, there was something wrong with them, there was something wrong with their system. A cultural anthropologist uh, will look at this and say, no, there's actually nothing inherent about the European system of economic exchange or capitalism. It's just another socially constructed expression of culture that is no better, it's no more normative than these other socially constructed expressions of culture, uh, these other systems of economic exchange. However, we still see a lot of people in our society uh, in disciplines outside of cultural anthropology who take the norms and the values of, uh, for example, capitalism uh, for granted as something universal to humanity. Uh, so summarizing that, cultural anthropologists study learned human behavior. Uh, we believe that that is what culture is. However, Sometimes people have a very hard time uh, when we apply that logic to our own societies because we start to see the social constructedness of things that are taken for granted as innate within our society or things that are not seen as learned behavior. Um, this gets really thorny when cultural anthropologists argue that the values of capitalism or Western gender norms are not inherent and normative to humanity. Um, an, another way to think about this, imagine someone uh, approaches me as an anthropologist and they ask me what do you study and I, I might say I study culture. I study the learned cultural behaviors of different people around the world. Um, I study clothing, music, rituals, language and the person's like yes I understand and I say and I study their gender expression and then the person may say wait a minute gender expression that's not culture that's universal men are born male and they know what that means and women are born female and they know what that means and it's inherent um, 
cultural anthropologists will say that's not what we observe studying humans all over the world. We've observed that most human behavior is very diverse, it's very plastic, and it's transmitted socially. Um, changing uh, gears just a little bit, I want to say something about distinguishing cultural anthropology from sociology. Uh, contemporary, or contemporary cultural anthropologists and sociologists tend to agree about a lot of the things that I just said. Um, however, we study these things differently. Our disciplines used to be more different than they are now. Um, there's much more overlap now than there used to be. Our disciplines, um, um, people used to say that if you study things in Western society, you're a sociologist. If you study others, you're an anthropologist. But that's not true. Uh, sociologists tend to do quantitative analysis of their data. Uh, they tend to work with large uh, sample sizes and they tend to analyze their data statistically. They tend to be uh, more overtly concerned with social problems and trying to explain them with data. Um, they might ask what, what percentage of people from a certain socioeconomic bracket are incarcerated with respect to other socioeconomic groups. Um, how do levels of education correspond with various outcomes in adulthood? Um, sociologists collect their data very often through surveys and through structured interviews uh, where they ask people questions um, that allow for responses that the sociologists are able to uh, code quantitatively for analysis. Anthropologists, on the other hand, uh, conduct qualitative analysis. Uh, we tend to collect our data through long-term in-person research. Uh, so this is, this is kind of a simplification, but while a sociologist will do quantitative analysis of the data that may show what patterns lead to greater likelihood of incarceration, uh, an anthropologist might attempt to spend a significant amount of time in a prison, uh, eating there, interacting with the prisoners if possible, getting, know, getting to know them. What do they do? What is their day like? Uh, what are their life histories? Uh, what do they wear? How do they pray? What do they eat? Um, this is called ethnographic research. Um, and when we publish it, the books that are based on this research are called ethnographies. Ethnographies are the stories that we collect and the interpretation that we include with them together. Now I said there's a, uh, there's a lot of overlap. Sociologists do conduct ethnographic research and anthropologists do quantitative analysis and use statistics. Um, but those are sort of the different priorities of our discipline. Moving along, um, let's talk about the reading. Um, I just spent some time talking about the importance of uh, recognizing the power of the belief uh, or, or recognizing social constructedness in our society and the overt attempt that we make as anthropologists uh, to try to be non-ethnocentric in our analysis. As we learned when we read Tyler uh, last